Morning, everybody. How are we doing? You good? I was standing backstage with Chris when David was calling for volunteers, and he was going, come on, come on, come on. And then he said, Chris Sully, come out. And he goes, dang it. So that's, that's, uh, that's sacrificial love from Chris. Well, uh, happy Sunday, everybody. Excited that, that you guys are here today. Excited to be with you today as we begin a brand new series. If you guys have been around 514 Church for any amount of time, and you've listened to the teaching and the preaching of Joel Kovacs, our lead pastor, you will quickly realize that in Joel's heart of hearts, like deep down in his soul, he is a creative. Joel is an artist, and his creativity and his artistry shows through in his preaching and his teaching, his craft, in all kinds of beautiful ways. But one of the ways that we see it most potently, and sometimes we tease him about this, is Joel has an uncanny ability to come up with like creative out-of-the-box titles for his series. So if you guys have been around, like you, you may have noticed this. It's like a title that has to do with the series, but it's kind of outside the box enough that you hear it, and you're like, I kind of want to hear more. Like, I kind of want to know what that's about. So like a few months ago, he had a, a series on the wisdom literature and, uh, in the Bible, and, and he called it Equations, Smoke, and Horses. And like that has something to do with what he was going to talk about. It has something to do with those books. But it's also like strange enough that you see that and you're like, I think I want to like hear what that's about. What is this series, Equation, Smoke, and Horses about? So that's part of the, the DNA, this creativity of naming your series, part of the DNA in our, church, uh, in our teaching ministry at this church. And so with this three-week series that we start today, I have thrown my hat into the ring in terms of creative series, and I've decided to name this series on the Trinity, Trinity. <laughs> so, it's called minimalism. You guys probably wouldn't understand, but, uh, but along with this series, we have uh, on our app, so, so if you have our app downloaded, we have some tools that can help you as we move along these three weeks. Uh, we have a reading plan that we actually started last week going into this week, and so if you didn't get enough notice. You can still go back and do that. It's not a particularly long, you know, sections of reading that we're, that we're saying uh, for you to do. And so you can go back and you can catch up, and we're going to do that all three weeks. And then we also have notes. So I've just put together notes on our app. If you go to our app at the bottom right-hand corner, uh, it says notes, and it says week one, Trinity. And these are like my notes for this week. You can follow along if you want. You can email them to yourself. You can take them home, uh, and you can just have those as we move forward. And so, you know, one of the things when, when you talk about, like, coming up with a series and talking for three weeks is, like, you really have to have something on your heart to talk about it for three weeks. It's a lot of talking. So the question is always, what are you going to talk about? What do you want to spend three weeks of intentionality leading the church through? And I decided that I wanted to talk about the Trinity for a couple reasons. Firstly, I think that the Trinity is perhaps the foundational element of the Christian faith. So what is it that makes Christianity unique? What is at the very foundation of the structure of Christian belief? And I actually think that it is this concept that God is Trinity, and not only is he Trinity, which means three, but he's triune, which means three in one. So this is like the heart of the Christian faith, and yet I think many Christians misunderstand it or don't understand it, and so just with that, it's worth taking time to sharpen our understanding on what it means when we say that God is Trinity. The other, the other reason I wanted to spend time on this is perhaps because of the reaction that some of you had when we said we were going to spend three weeks talking about the Trinity. It's like, it's complicated. It's complex. Three weeks, I don't know. Uh, it's almost like for, for many of us, the Trinity is something that we would rather avoid talking about. Like it's a, like it's a problem that needs to be solved. You know, where it's something that is so abstract that it doesn't really matter. It's not practical to our lives. Three in one, three and one. Like, what does that mean? And instead of trying to go through all those mental gymnastics, can I just, like, say that I believe it because Christians are supposed to and then never think about it again for the rest of my life? I actually think that we need to turn our focus, turn our perspective a little bit as we go into this week because it is confusing in some ways. It is complex in some ways. But what I want us to go into this series understanding is that the God of the Bible is Trinity. So when you talk about God as a Christian, you're talking about the Trinity. 
So to understand God is to, to some degree, understand the Trinity. If we think of God, as many of us do, just instinctually, as a singular being above all beings that's out there, then we fundamentally misunderstand him. And if we misunderstand God, then we will be inhibited to some degree in our ability to actually know him. And remember that to, to, to walk this life as a Christian is to know God. To be a Christian means to know God. That's the heart of the Christian life. Psalm 105 says, look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. To be a Christian is to seek the face of God, to know him better and better, to encounter him and to experience him. And if God is fundamentally Trinity, then we have to at least try to understand what that means and why that matters if we are indeed going to seek the face of God. And then what if I told you that to understand the Trinity is not to just understand some fancy theological concept and it's not just to go into needless abstraction. What if I told you that to understand the Trinity is to understand the beauty of God? That when we say that God is beautiful, what that means in, in the Christian faith is that that beauty is locked up in what it means to be the Trinity. What it means when we say that God is Trinity is what we mean when we say that God is beautiful. And so in order to understand his beauty, in order to experience his beauty, we have to unlock what it means to say that he's Trinity, to say that he's triune that he's three in one. Now, I am actually very concerned with the church knowing and experiencing the beauty of God. I actually think that many of the places that the modern church falls short is exactly in our lack of understanding that very thing, in understanding his beauty, in seeing his beauty. You know, we as a church are supposed to be on mission. The, the purpose and the meaning of our life is supposed to be bound up in the God that we claim to worship. Everything we do is supposed to revolve around that God. All of our allegiances, all of our priorities get shifted upon entering into this relationship with God, and our whole life changes. You know, we have written on the wall out there, you are the light. That is a mission statement. It means that you are supposed to be light. The light is supposed to get in you and then shine from you. And that means that your whole life is going to be changed. Everything is going to look different. But how could we possibly move into mission for God if we are not captivated by his beauty? You know, we're supposed to repent. Like turn away from sin. Turn back towards God always. But how were we expected to turn away from sin and to turn back towards God unless we believe that the God we're turning to is actually more beautiful and desirable than the sin in our life. When Joel was teaching on the parables the last few weeks, the teachings of Jesus, he said something that stuck with me week one. He said that the teachings of Jesus, is, they're supposed to shock us. You know, the God that we worship is supposed to be shocking. It's supposed to shake us. The good news is supposed to grab a hold of us and like electrify us. And so the question for the Christians in the room is, has the good news that God has given us in this world, has it shocked us? Has it shaken us? Has it taken hold of us? Because it is the beauty that shocks and it is the beauty that strikes. And if we are not electrified by the beauty of God, good luck going out in the world and being on mission. Good luck going out there if we are not absolutely captivated by the beauty of God. And I believe that in order to do that, in order to feel that beauty, in order to understand what it means to say that God is beautiful, we have to understand the Trinity. We have to be taken by the beauty of God. So what does this exactly have to do with the Trinity, the fact that God is three in one triune? Karl Barth, perhaps the most important theologian of the 20th century says this, the triunity of God is the secret to his beauty. If we deny this, we at once have a God without radiance and without joy, a God without beauty. Losing the dignity and power of real divinity, he also loses his beauty. But if we keep to this, that the one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we cannot escape the fact either in general or in detail that apart from anything else, God is also beautiful, the beauty of God, locked in the, in the triunity of God. Now, we just did a four-week class on apologetics, and so you need to know 
that I believe that God is real. And almost every time I stand up and, and preach and teach, I teach out of Genesis chapter 1. It's my favorite uh, book of, of the whole scriptures. And it's the creation story. And so you need to know that I believe that God is powerful. Not only is God real, and not only is God powerful, but he is also beautiful. And I actually want to know that beauty, and I want to be caught up in that joy, and I want to encounter that radiance, that light. I want to know God in all of his joy, in all of his beauty, in all of his splendor. And if his beauty is locked up in the Trinity, then I want to unlock that so that we as a church can try to the best of our ability to see God as he truly is. So over the next three weeks, we are not on a quest to become philosophers, and we're not on a quest to sound smart, and we're not on a quest to just be abstract and think complex things. Uh, we are on a quest to know the living God and to experience the beauty of the one who defines all beauty. And so we dive into this concept of Trinity. Now, how should we describe the Trinity? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, th do three things today to try to describe the Trinity. We're going to talk about, uh, we're going to put up a, a philosophical statement that uses some big words that, that comes down to us through church history, through the creeds. Did anybody grow up in a church where you recited the creeds? Not really. Some, some people. Yeah, some people. So in some churches, you recite these creeds, beautiful formulations from, from church history. And so there's like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed. And these creeds are fundamentally Trinitarian creeds. You'll see this Father, Son, Holy Spirit breakdown in them. Uh, but these are some of the best minds, not just of the Christian church history, but in the history of recorded thought that came together fought it out, argued with each other to try to formulate simply what it means to say that God is Trinity. So we're going to put that up there. And then after that, we're going to talk about some analogies or some word pictures that we use to try to help us understand some of the more complicated parts of the Trinity. And we're going to look at how those two things together are helpful and we should engage with them. But at the end of the day, they might actually fall short in what our goal is. Our goal is not just to know something. Our goal is to see the beauty of God and to experience that. And so the third thing we're going to do is we're going to open the scriptures. And we're going to see how the scriptures talk about the Trinity. And in that, and, and, and studying that, and meditating on that, and contemplating that, I think in that is the key to understanding why God as Trinity makes God beautiful. And so here's a somewhat complex philosophical statement to define the Trinity. All right, the Trinity. In the unity of God's essence, there subsist three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are consubstantial and co-eternal, yet distinct in the personal mode of their existence. The Father, eternally begetting the Son, and the Spirit, eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. So again, this description took hundreds and hundreds of years, comes down through these creeds, and this is about as simple of a distillation or a summary as I can put in front of us. I think these words are accurate. I think this description is accurate, and some of the concepts that it's driving at are really important for us to understand. Now, the, the only problem with this is it feels, when you read it, kind of cold and distant, doesn't it? Like there's words in here that you don't use. When was the last time you described something as co-eternal? I would like to know what you were talking about <laughs> if you have used that before. Now, it's not impossible to understand what that means, right? Co means together, and eternal means without beginning and without end. So the reason that this is important is because this is saying that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all eternal together. There's no sequence. There's no order. It wasn't the Father first, and then the Son, and then the Spirit, even though they have this Father-Son-Spirit relationship. The whole relationship is eternal. If you don't see that, then it's easy to fall into what church history is called heresy, where you create a hierarchy or a ranking of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because the Father came first. So no one came first. No one came last. They are co-eternal. The second word that we don't use is consubstantial. I know that you don't use that word, okay? 
Uh, again, it's not impossible to understand what that means. Con means, you know, uh, uh, same or, or with. And substantial comes from substance, the word substance. So they're the same substance, the same essence. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are distinct, but they're not similar substance to each other. They are the same substance. That's what makes them uh, unity, three in one. They're the same substance. Again, if you don't understand that, it's easy to think, okay, if they're differing in their substance, there has to be some kind of ranking or order or hierarchy or differentiating factors between them other than their relationship. And according to church history, there's not. So they're, they're, they're co-eternal, they're consubstantial, it's three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So this is important for us to understand. We should respect the tradition, and we should see that this is actually a very helpful tool in understanding what it is when we say that God is Trinity, although I'm not sure that just studying this helps us see the beauty of God. I don't know if it helps us dive in and seek the face of the God that I'm claiming is beauty. And it's actually pretty complex. You know, you start to, to talk about those words. And so one of the things that we do, and maybe you grew up in Sunday school and you went through this, or maybe uh, at a church if you had like a Trinity Sunday, you went through this. But we use analogies or word pictures to try to help us understand how God can be both three and one, because that's kind of a confusing thing. So a metaphor that sometimes gets thrown out is that God is like an egg. You guys heard this metaphor before? The Trinity is like an egg. There's the shell, and there's the egg white, and there's the egg yolk. Those are three separate, distinct parts but in one unity. So how can God be three and one? Well, it's kind of like an egg. Or maybe you've heard the analogy that God is like a three-leaf clover. There's three leaves, but it's one clover. So like three and one. Uh, or maybe you've heard the, the analogy with water. You heard that God is like water because water can be a liquid or a solid or a gas. It's the same substance. It's a different mode. And then I actually heard one recently that I hadn't heard before that's actually pretty helpful. It says that God, as Trinity, is like a waterfall that goes down into a river that empties into a lake. Because it's like the same substance all at the same time in three different modes. And so, you know, God is like an egg. God is like a three-leaf clover. God is like water. And, and these metaphors are helpful in the sense that they can help us see how three can be one, right? So it's like a, a thinking tool. It's a tool to think. How can God be three in one? Well, you have these pictures of an egg and water and a leaf. Uh, and, it, and in that specific way, I think that these pictures are actually helpful. But here's the problem. And this is just what I want us to be careful about. Um, the Trinity is supposed to unlock the beautiful God that we as Christians are supposed to encounter in our daily walk. And so the question is, what is God like? God is not like an egg. God is not like a leaf. And God is not like an ice cube. When I want people to see God, I don't want them to think of an egg. That's not what I mean when I say beauty. So these things are helpful, but they, they fall short in our ability to do what it is that we all came here to do, which is to encounter the living God and understand him and know him and seek his face better. And so what is God like? What is he like? How do we, what do we mean when we say that he's Trinity? To answer this, I wanna open the scriptures. And we're gonna read four separate verses from four different times of redemptive history in four different contexts. And I want us to, to read these and to see where, where it leads us. And so we start in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. This is the baptism of Jesus. This is what it says. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my Son, whom I love. With him I am very pleased. Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 18, you may know this as the Great Commission. 
Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So these are from the the mouth of Jesus. We go to the early church. And Paul writes his letter to the church in Ephesus. And in uh, chapter 4, he's talking about what it looks like to build the church of the God that they worship. And he says that there is one body and there's one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. This is Paul's sign-off to his second letter to the church in Corinth. He says, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do you notice something from these passages? You know, it's not the exact language that you and I use when we say Trinity. But in these key passages that we just read, passages that reflect Jesus in history, that reflect the mission of the church, that reflect the reality of worship and the blessings of being God's people, God is quite simply described as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. The word triune does not appear in the Bible. These are conceptual frameworks that that the church has come up with to help us understand who God, who is Trinity, actually is and what that means. In the Bible, in redemptive history, the God that continuously appears, the God that we say saves is Trinity because that God continuously appears as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so it means that God is a Father. And it means that God is a son, and it means that God is spirit. What does it mean when we say that God is trinity? That's what it means. Why does that matter? Why is that important? That matters, and that's important because we know what those words mean. We know what it means to be a father. We know what it means to be a son. And actually, we actually know what it means to be spirit. So when we talk about God, and we use the biblical language of Father, Son, and Spirit, it helps us understand who he is because we actually know those words. What does it mean to be a father? Well, preeminently, it means to give life to a, to a child. And in the perfection of fatherhood, it means to love that child. What does it mean to be a son? Well, first and foremost, it means to have been given life, to have been begotten by a father, And in the perfection of sonship, it means to receive the love of the Father and to reciprocate it back to the Father. So we know Father and we know Son. What does it mean to be spirit? This is a little bit more tricky because of the way that we tend to use that word. But in the original language, uh, spirit in in, uh, Hebrew is ruach, and in Greek it's pneuma, and it just means breath. What does it mean to be breath? It means to proceed from, right? You breathe in, and then you breathe out, and the breath proceeds from you. You, Your breath is breathed out. And in the perfect relationship of the loving father and the loving son, that breath proceeds as love between all three of the persons of the Godhead. And so the, the most foundational understanding of the Trinity is that the father begets the son. Have you heard that word before, begotten? to produce. The father begets the son to generate. The son is begotten or generated by the father, and then the spirit proceeds like breath from the father and the son. And these descriptions, this is where it gets confusing, and this is typically where our brains have to stretch. These descriptions of their relationships are eternal. So so remember we said earlier co-eternal? Father, Son, and Spirit. Are co- so their relationships are co-eternal too. There's never a time when the Father was not the begetter of the Son. And there was never a time where the Son was not begotten by the Father. And there was never a time where the Spirit was not being breathed out by the Father and the Son as love. It's an eternal relationship. The Father did not exist first. 
and then begot the Son, and then they breathed the Spirit. To be eternal means that there is no when. These relationships of fatherhood, sonship, and procession are always and forever, for all of eternity. It's just who God is. To be eternal is just to be. There's no beginning. There's no end. We're not bound by time and space and matter, but God is transcendent of time. And so, for example, the Son... To be son has no duration or succession of moments. There was never a time when the relationship between the father and the son and the spirit was not. It's always been perfect love generated, love sent, and love received, all within the being of God. Now, that's confusing for us because we are not eternal, So we are finite and we're bound by time. So we experience all of reality as a succession of moments. This happens and this happens and this happens. We understand fatherhood, but like you're not a father and then you conceive a child and now you are a father. The child is not, then it's conceived, now it is. You're not breathing out, you're holding your breath and then you breathe out and the breath comes. But but that's not God because God is not bound by the time. Like we are, it's eternal. It's forever. And so the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are eternal and infinite. His fatherhood, his sonship, and the breathing out of the Spirit. There is no end. There is no sequence. And it's all bound up in the very being of God. And so as Father, Son, and Spirit, what does that mean for who God is? And how does that unlock the the beauty of God? It means that in and of himself, The God that we worship is a beautiful relationship of love. In and of himself, without anything else, without anyone else, even before and outside of creation, God is love generated. The Father, love sent. The Spirit, love received. The Son, perfectly reciprocated back. All within his own essence. He is not dependent on us for love. He is love. He has love. When we say that God is beautiful, this is what we mean. Have you ever heard Christians say that God is love? This is not like uh, saying that actually God is really loving. This is a statement about his being. Who is he? What is he like? God is love. And you and I understand love. You know, we, most of us, we have experienced love in our life, but we have not experienced perfect love. You know, your father may have been a good father, or he may have been a bad father, but most likely he was an imperfect combination of those two things. That is not so with the father. The father is perfectly loving to his son. And as a child, you may have been a good child, or you may have been a bad child, or you may have been most likely an imperfect combination of both. Not so with the son. The son perfectly receives the father's love and reciprocates it back to him. And you as a person, as a lover, someone who loves, you may have sent your love to somebody. You may have given your love to another person. And you may have done that well, or you may have done that not so well, but most likely you did it imperfectly. That is not so with the Spirit. The Spirit is perfect love, breathed out by the perfect Father and the perfect Son in a perfect relationship in the unity of God that is love. Now, the reason that this matters for us is because we have glimpses of this love in our life. And when someone in your life even images imperfectly love like this, it, it captures us. It changes us. It rocks our world. We're never the same, but we don't even experience that perfect love in these relationships. But God does because God is He is love. Now, when you think about that, if God were solitary, not Trinity, if he was unitary, not Father, Son, and Spirit, maybe he could do loving things. Like maybe if a solitary, unitary God created the world, maybe you could say that that was a loving thing to do. Maybe that God could do loving things, but that God could not be love. Who would he have loved? before creation. The fact that God is three in one is why we as Christians stand around and we say, who is God? And we say, well, God is love. And so this is the God that we worship. 
the God who does not just love, but is love. He is love in his essence. He is love in his being. He is love in his nature. He is love. Um, fatherhood. Perfect fatherhood. Sonship. Perfect sonship. And the sending of love, the spirit. Perfect love sent, received, and generated all within his own being. And the reason that this matters for us is because who we think God is has a lot to do with what our lives are going to look like for him and what we think our life is about. This God of love is the God that we gaze upon. It's the God whose face we seek. It's the God we're asked to trust, and it's the God we're asked to give up everything for. It's the God whose beauty we're supposed to be struck by and transformed by. We're asked to believe that God became flesh and blood and died for us. Well, why would we believe that? Well, we might believe that if we actually think that because in his essence, he is perfect love, that that's actually who he is. Uh, this is the God into whose image we're supposed to be transformed and conformed to. What are we supposed to become like in our life? We're not just supposed to do nice things. We're supposed to become love. Why? Because the God that we seek to be transformed into is love. He's not a solitary distant God. He's not an egg. He's not a leaf. He's not an ice cube. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. Perfect love, generated, received, reciprocated, all within his own being. And so the question of the Christian life is what kind of beauty would you leave everything for? What kind of beauty would you bleed for, sacrifice for, suffer, and die for? What kind of beauty would send you on mission? What kind of beauty has the power to radiate you with such light that you might actually become that light? Only the beauty of a God who is love. And God is love precisely because he's Trinity. Father, Son, Spirit. All within his own essence. Perfect love generated, sent, and received. Now, in terms of what this means for our life, um, when you read the story of the Bible, and I think you can map this perfectly onto your own life, when you read the story of the, the, the scriptures, the biggest obstacle to our flourishing is that we don't trust God. That's the biggest obstacle to human flourishing. We don't trust him. Uh, we don't repent and turn away from sin that enslaves and destroys us because we're not sure if what he has is actually better. We, we don't really trust him. We don't surrender our deepest desires to him, the things in our hearts that we're ashamed of that we could actually offer up to him. We don't do it because we don't know if we can actually trust him. And the question is, should we trust him? It depends on what he's like. It depends on what he's like. Um, do we think he's like solitary and lonely? Because the picture of that God, to me, oftentimes comes to be disappointed in me angry with me, maybe even like wants to, to, to smite me. You know, do we think he's annoyed with us? Do you think that he just kind of lets us into his presence like begrudgingly? Like, all right, fine. Because if he's actually like that, then, then we should be afraid of him. If that is the picture of God in your head, then I would not run into his arms. I would not turn away from whatever it is you're doing and turn to him. If the God that a lot of us actually picture is that way, not Trinity, not perfect love in and of himself, in his essence, but kind of an angry, solitary, distant, judgmental God, I wouldn't run to him. I wouldn't go to that God. What, what would make you do that? You know, this is how I always used to see God. You know, my faith life is interesting because I came to faith in college, but I always believed in God. Like I hadn't given my life to Christ and understood the gospel, but I always believed that there was a God. But it was this kind of God, you know, a lonely, solitary being above all beings, distant from me. And if he noticed me at all, I was kind of an inconvenience, you know. And, and I remember as a child, you try to pray to that God and you try to ask that God for things. And it's basically impossible, you know. Certainly impossible to ask him to heal your soul or to make you whole because like with a God like that, that request doesn't even really make any sense. 
not only are you not going to run into the arms of a God who's like that, but you actually shouldn't. And that picture of God still creeps into my life from time to time. You know, they say old habits die hard. And so what did you first picture God like? Well, this was my first picture of God. That's where I thought he was like. And it still creeps into my life, and I have moments, and I have seasons where that is how I conceive of God. And when that happens, I do not repent. I do not pray. I do not turn back to God. I do not trust him to lead me into true life. But it's only because I'm seeing him incorrectly. What if he's not like that? What if he really is like what the Bible says? What if he really is Trinity? What if he really is Father, Son, and Spirit? Perfect Father, perfect Son, perfect Spirit. Love generated, love sent, love received and reciprocated perfectly, all within his own essence. If God is like that, then why wouldn't we trust him? Why wouldn't we run into his arms like the story of the prodigal son? Why wouldn't we believe that he actually had that feast waiting for us, that he had true life waiting for us? Why wouldn't we run to him? I want us to begin this series with this understanding of God. When we say that God is Trinity, when we say that God is love, and when we say that God is beautiful, we mean that he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because those perfect, eternal relationships in the very being of God is what he is. Those aren't attributes that he has. Those aren't things that he feels on good days. It is who he is. Who is God? Father, Son, and Spirit. And all of the things that that means. And so when you think about it like this, the Trinity is not actually that abstract. It's like emotive and transformative. And it beckons us to step into it. Who, who wouldn't want to participate in a God like that? You know, the gospel that we're asked to believe, and we're going to talk about this next week, is that God himself like, emptied himself and became like us just to die for us and just to save us. And one of the things that I think is in our subconscious sometimes is like, we don't really know if God would do that for us. Like, we're like, yeah, we believe it, and sometimes we'll even take communion and we'll eat it, but like, I don't know. Like, is that really how God feels about me? Because there's a lot of shame in my sin, and there's a lot of pain in my life, and there's a lot of guilt that I feel. So like, yeah, God did that, but like, why did he do that? Well, it depends on who you think he is. It depends on what you think he's like. If you think that he's Trinity, then that story is but a natural outpouring of the character of God, of the definition of his being. God did that because that's who God is. So over the next few weeks, we're going to discuss the implications that the Trinity has and the most important aspects of your faith. Um, we're God worshipers. And so what that God is like is going to determine how that manifests in the worship of our life. And so uh, next week, we're going to talk about creation and personhood and salvation. Who are you? When you say that you're a Christian, who are you? What does it mean? And how does viewing it through the lens of a God who is Trinity, who is love, change what we think about existence and experience and identity and meaning and purpose and salvation? What does it mean to say that you're saved? Why would God do that for us? After that, we're going to talk about practices of the Christian life, prayer, evangelism, discipleship, because like, what are we being invited to do? What is God asking of us? Well, it depends on what he's like, and how we reflect him depends on what we think he's like. And so we're going to talk about all these things. I think that it is impossible to actually grasp your own existence, let alone how to pray without understanding and seeing it through the lens of the Trinity, the God who in his very essence is perfect love. And so we're gonna dive into that over the next few weeks. Um, and to end today on this reflection of who God is, really try to step into believing that when we say that God is Trinity, this is what we mean. Um, the band's going to come out, and we're going to sing uh, 
Now, I actually can't remember what that song is. I'm very bad with, with music. But the song that was talking about Father, Son, and Spirit all in one, very Trinitarian song. Uh, and, I, and I want us to like really think about what that means. Like seriously, what does it mean to say that God is love? Not that he's done some loving things, but to say that's who he is. Because when we say he's Trinity, that's exactly what we're saying for all the reasons today. What does that mean for you? Where does your understanding of God fall short of that? Where are you afraid to trust him because maybe you haven't internalized that yet? Where are you afraid to let him search your heart and your soul because you don't know if you should give that to him? How does understanding God the way that the scriptures talk about him in his triunity change that? Uh, and so I'm gonna pray. And then when the band comes out, I want you guys to stand up with them and to worship. Uh, Father, we are here today to know you and to become one with you in Christ through the Spirit. And as we think through who you are, uh, give us grace and peace and be patient with us and send your light and love into us. Forgive us our sins and give us the strength to move toward you and trust because we know who you are. We love you and we give our whole hearts to you. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, that we pray and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey everyone, we are so glad that you hung out with us today. Uh, we would love to connect with you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to hear from you. So please text hi to the number on the screen and we can't wait to see you soon.